Welcome back to another Motobob video and you join me in the studio again with what has to be the best looking adventure bike on the market, the Africa Twin Adventure Sports. Now I've been riding it for the past four or five weeks, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself and so in this video I'll give you my full review and tell you why I think it's a little bit underrated. But before we get started, a massive thanks to Sysapp for sponsoring this video. They make this awesome GPS tracking device, which will notify your phone if your pride and joy ever gets moved or messed with. It's super easy to install, just hook it up to the battery, install the app, and enter the code on your device. Now the device itself is pretty small and it comes with a sticky pad on the back, so it's easy to hide in the bodywork of the bike, and it's also IP65 waterproof rated. Now not only does it help to protect your bike from theft, but it has loads of other great features on top. You can save and share your ride history, you can create group rides and see the location of your mates if they get lost. It'll tell you about the health of your bike's battery and if the device gets disconnected and there's crash detection too. It really is a lot of features for the money and it also comes with a two year warranty as standard. There's a link down in the description to their full product page where you can find all the details as well as a 15% discount code for my viewers. Now look, this idea that it's somewhat underrated, it kind of stems back from the engine. The previous gen of this bike was 1000cc and then a couple of years back they updated it with this 1100. And to be honest, in either iteration, it kind of falls between what we call now the middleweight, so Tiger 900, KTM 890, BMW F850 GS, and then the true heavyweight, so Tiger 1200, BMW R 1250 GS, Multistrada V4, KTM 1290, those sorts of bikes. And it's kind of the same with the performance figures so peak power is 100 horsepower it makes that at seven and a half thousand rpm and then 105 newton meters of peak torque at about 6 250 i think so peak power is nowhere near really some of those proper super adventure bikes yet it's still a little above what you'd expect from the middleweights and it makes a bit more torque as well but honestly having ridden it in plenty of scenarios over the past few weeks I feel like this is pretty much as capable as the large capacity adventure bikes. Certainly for solo riding, I haven't really felt like it's particularly slow and you only feel that lack of top end power when you're really, really gassing it. For motorway work, for just getting around, for commuting, for even some more sprightly riding, that usable mid-range and torquiness is absolutely enough and plenty of fun. It's also surprisingly smooth for a big parallel twin and it makes a lovely note at the exhaust. Now for the adventure bike riders who are truly seeking thrills and top end power, of course there are better options. I'd also think about whether you're gonna do a lot of riding like two up with luggage. Perhaps if you wanna perform like quick overtakes, it's not gonna feel as sprightly as some of those other options. But if out and out speed isn't your main objective and you prefer an engine with a really nice character to it, then definitely have a look at this one. Now I've also got a touch on the DCT box or dual clutch transmission. In short, it allows the bike to operate like an automatic. So you can stick it in auto mode and it will make the shifts on your behalf. Or you can put it in manual and use these plus and minus buttons to shift the gears yourself. No clutch lever though, it's all done electronically and it uses two clutches, hence dual clutch transmission, and two sets of gears to seamlessly shift between the gears as it goes up the box and then back down again. The result on the road is like, yeah, from a standstill still it will go all the way up to sixth gear speeds seamlessly you know there's no lurching or anything like that sounds great in principle but there are a few downsides even though your wallet will be a thousand pounds lighter your bike will be 10 kilograms heavier and it's also not quite got the finesse of slipping the clutch at lower speeds. You have to drag quite a bit of back brake. I think personally, having put plenty of miles in on this bike, I'd go for the manual regular gearbox and then use some of the grand I've saved to buy the quick shifter upgrade. So there you've got the clutch if you want it, but also the fun and novelty and sportiness and some of the smoothness of a quick shifter and blipper. It's personal preference though. It really is a good system. It ties into the inertial measurement unit on this bike. So it knows when it's cornering, it knows when it's dis sending downhill so it's not going to shift up so that you lose engine braking. Most of the time I thought it was 
fantastic. So definitely check it out. It comes down a little bit to personal preference. And I would say probably the killer feature of DCT is if you do a lot of two up riding. That smoothness between shifts, both up and down the box, you know, that's going to be more meaningful to someone on the back of the bike than someone who's on the front holding onto the bars. And so less lurching, less of those headbutts on the back of your lid. And so I reckon a passenger would love it. Now onto the handling and look, this is a big bike. Like I say, 200 50 kilograms with the DCT. You get a 25 litre tank, which is great for range, but when it's fueled up, obviously it makes the bike feel a little more top heavy. And it's pretty tall as well, so the standard seat is adjustable between 850 and 870 mil. Granted, you can get a 25 mil lower seat accessory, but overall it's a big tall bike, and so at lower speeds, if you're not super tall like me, it just takes a little bit of getting used to, especially with the DCT, you're effectively riding it on the throttle. It does feel very stable though, and you do have nice wide bars here, very wide bars, so you've got a lot of leverage there, but clearly a bike like this isn't going to thrive in town traffic. It's not really designed for that, and where it does excel is on the open road. Now this bike is the top spec of the Africa Twin lineup, so it gets the full Showa electronic suspension setup. I've got the two user configurable riding modes set up pretty much the same, but one has firm damping and one has much softer damping. Stick it in that soft mode and it really is dead comfy when you're cruising in a straight line. On the more engaging and twisty roads, it impressed me as well. This is another area in which I think it outperforms the spec sheet. I mean, sure, it's got the top draw suspension on this model, but it's still a big adventure bike. You've got large diameter spoked wheels, adventure tires, and the braking setup isn't the latest and greatest from Brembo, but on Honestly, it handles really very nicely. I had a lot of fun on this bike carving up twistier roads and the brakes, like I say, they're easily up to the job. I did notice though a little bit of squeal when you get down to sort of walking speed, but perhaps they're still bedding in a little. This press bike doesn't have many miles on it and otherwise the braking performance is great. Plenty of power, plenty of feel. I'd also say another massive strength of this bike is the comfort. I mean, the riding position for me, although the seat is slightly on the tall side, when you get moving, you've got plenty of space to move around. Big wide bars, which feel great on the motorway, a tall commanding riding position, yet you've got plenty of wind protection. So a big tank that flares out and then also an adjustable windscreen. So you just use these two little catches here and it can be down. So you've got good visibility over it or up for a little bit more wind protection. Not quite as good as something like the NT1100. I rode that on the launch a couple of months ago. It's based upon the same engine and chassis as this bike, but it's more road focused than touring focused. So you really do get a big screen on that bike and great protection on your feet from spray from the front wheel. But as far as adventure bikes go, this is super comfortable for me. A few of the nice features would be the hand guards to keep a little bit of wind off your hands and then you get heated grips as standard on this bike. Perhaps you might get a heated seat elsewhere, but personally, I wear heated trousers and jacket under my riding gear and so it's not a necessity for me. Now in terms of tech, this is pretty much up there with most of the large capacity adventure bikes. There are only a few features that are missing that I'll get onto. It does get an inertial measurement unit as I've mentioned. So you've got plenty of riding modes and rider aids and you can customize them through the screen and they take that lean angle data into account so that they're corner insensitive. You get a pretty great TFT screen up there as well, nice and big. It's got Bluetooth connection Activity, so you can use Honda's own phone integration for nav and stuff like that but also it supports CarPlay and Android Auto. So you can use your favorite apps for calls, messages, music, podcasts, and navigation. Personally, I love using CarPlay in my car. It's way better than the proprietary apps. The only thing on this bike is that the USB port is up by the bars. So something like the Goldwing, you'll have a stash for your phone in the trunk or the top case. That keeps the phone out of the way, keeps the bars nice and clean and clear, but still allows you access to all of those apps and allows you to control them with the switch gear. The Tiger 900, it doesn't have CarPlay, but it has a similar idea for an adventure bike. It's got a little waterproof stash box under the saddle. Keeps the phone out of the way, but still allows you to interact with it through the bike's infotainment system. And yeah, I think I'd kind of like to see something similar on this bike. Having the phone plugged into the cockpit area means that you have to mount it on the bars. And if the phone's on the bars anyway, 
you may as well use that screen for phone functionality, so nav and whatever. And that means that you still get to use that brilliant TFT screen for the basic riding information and managing riding modes and all those sorts of general riding data. Still, it's a nice feature. It's a massive USP. You can get it on some Harleys and some Indians, but generally Hondas are the only other bikes you find it on. And this is the only adventure bike, I think, with CarPlay. And so for some people who really like CarPlay or Android Auto, that's going to be a massive selling point of this bike. There's lots of other nice little touches like the power outlet in the cockpit there. It does get cornering headlights as well, so it illuminates the inside of a turn when it's banked over. It gets their emergency brake light system, so it flashes the indicators when you're hard on the brakes. And so yeah, it's pretty comprehensive. There are just a few things I thought of that other bikes offer that this doesn't. The cruise control is great, but some bikes now offer adaptive or active cruise control that use radars to follow the traffic ahead. You can get it on the KTM, you can get it on the Ducati. Some BMWs have it, so it can't be long before we see it on the GS. And even the new Tiger 1200, it doesn't have active cruise control, but it does get a rear radar for blind spot warnings. It also doesn't get keyless ignition. Some people love it, some people, I think, absolutely hate the idea. Personally, I don't find it a massive problem to operate a key. And also, I've had it on press bikes where the batteries got low, and I've just thought, I oh, wish it was just a normal, regular key so I don't have to sort this out. Then again, it is quite convenient to have like the steering lock and the filler cap all integrated into a keyless system. So again, some people won't care, but others, if you want that, you'll have to get it elsewhere. Now the last thing, and I think I've noticed this more because it's February, so it's pretty dark in the evenings, is that it doesn't get illuminated switch gear. Even my lowly Tiger 800 has it, and um, especially with this many buttons, it'd be nice to see where stuff is. I mean, perhaps if you own the bike for a long time, it becomes sort of muscle memory to find certain buttons and so you don't rely on seeing them so much. But yeah, if you live in the Somerset area and over the past few weeks, you've heard someone riding around on an Africa Twin in the evenings, randomly honking the horn, that'd be me. But you know, overall, I think it's a great tech package on this bike, and I don't want to take away from that. I think active cruise and keyless, at least, are largely personal preference. Now, of course, most adventure bike riders are purely utilitarian and functionality-focused beings, but it has to be said, this is a heck of a good-looking bike, and if you bought it for that reason, I would not resent you. I like that it's bold, it's got that tricolour paint job, the new big Africa Twin logo, the gold forks and handlebars and rims really set it off. It's modern, it's got a bit of personality with the sort of face that they've given it. And then it's got this very aggressive looking stance where it really does bulk up towards the top here and gives it a very muscular appearance. We've got some good looking adventure bikes on the market at the moment. The Tiger 900 Rally Pro in matte khaki green. I think that's a beautiful looking bike. Also the Husqvarna Norden 901. What a great looking machine that is. But for me, this is the one that does it out of the whole adventure market. I think it is really genuinely, absolutely gorgeous. It's totally subjective though, so let me know what you think of it looks wise down in the comments below. Now let's talk about value for money, and I think it really depends whether this looks like good value at where you're starting from. In this spec with the DCT and the electronic suspension, this is top of the range, so it's like 17 and a half grand, and on the face of it, it sounds like a lot of money. Certainly, if you consider this a competitor to the middleweights, like I was saying earlier, then it does look quite expensive. But to me, in capability, this feels like a large capacity adventure bike. We just talked about all the tech it has, but it's also got that presence, it's got the fuel range, it's got that wind protection, it's got the stability, it's got plenty of space to carry full luggage and a passenger. And so in that case, you would compare it directly to the GS because that's the biggest seller by far in that market. If you spec up a GS Adventure in the rally trim, so a similar look to this bike, and you add the necessary packages for like heated grips, cruise control, their electronic suspension, it starts to come up pretty similar, if not a little more expensive than this bike. Now look, the GS does have more power, more peak torque, a little more fuel capacity, and look, it's a proven bestseller and for good reason, but the Africa Twin certainly has its own merits. Like I just said, looks wise, I think it's brilliant. The handling perhaps has a little more feedback, and then you've got a few little USPs that you can't get elsewhere on the market, like CarPlay, Android Auto, and the DCT option. So overall, super impressed with it, and like I say, I think it does a little bit better on the road than the spec sheet suggests. As always, I'd love to know what you think of it down in the comments below, and perhaps which bike you'd go for. And also, I didn't really cover off-roading today, because in about a month's time, I'm doing two days with the Honda Adventure Experience down in Devon, and we'll be riding the more off-road biased base version. So if you want to see that video when it goes 
Live. If you're not subscribed already, hit subscribe and I'll see you then.